Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Tizar, and I'm a professor at Texas A&M University. And I'm responsible for our exotic bird research program in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Our concern is the health and well-being of exotic birds. And as you can tell from the sign, we really focus on parrots. So I will spend a little time telling you about the smartest of birds. Parrots, there are many bright birds. Birds, of course, have to be smart to survive in the, uh, in the forest. Birds have to be smart to survive in the wild. But parrots excel in their ability to do all sorts of things. Now you remember, I'm sure you're aware of this stage, that scientists believe that birds are small flying dinosaurs. You can just look at this picture of a baby parrot and you can see the remarkable family resemblance to a tyrannosaurus. There's about 10,000 different species of birds in the world today. Um, they're fine in all continents. They fly over all the oceans. Some of them, of course, travel very widely. They migrate north and south. We're in the middle of spring migration right now. Other birds are confined to a specific host range and don't travel very far. Indeed. But either way, they need to be smart. They need to know where they are. They need to know how to get to food, how to get home when need be. They need a lot of brain power in order to do that. So, how do we measure that smartness? How do we measure that brain power? Well, if we measure smartness by a bird's ability to learn, by a bird's ability to adapt to new environments, then the clear leaders are the parrots, and surprisingly enough, the crows. They too are very bright. But we're gonna, today we're just going to focus on parrots and, uh, and their abilities. Uh, birds like this wonderful scarlet macaw from the rainforests of South America. Now, if we focus just on parrots, there's about 350 different sorts of parrots in the world. Many of them are tropical birds. They tend to live in, uh, in places like the rainforest. And of course, you have to be smart to survive in the jungle. You have to be able to know where the food is, how to avoid the predators, how to, how to find places, good places to live. And, and one of the things that is unique about parrots is they live for a very long time. This is a great advantage because you, over the years, you pick up wisdom, right? Like your parents do. You know? The older you are, the longer you live, the more experiences you have, the, the better you are at functioning. And parrots can live an awful long time. Some parrots can live for longer than 100 years. And that's a great advantage when you're trying to survive in the wilderness. Now, parrots, of course, are very specialized birds. They're actually seed eaters. They specialize in eating the toughest, hardest seeds there are. Here, for example, is the skull of a hyacinth macaw. This is a large blue macaw that lives in Brazil. And you'll notice it has a giant beak specifically designed for crushing the hardest of nuts. Because in those nuts, there are lots of nutrients. And one of the richest sources of nutrients, after all, that's how plants get their start in life, by using those nutrients. So parrots, with their enormous beaks, can exploit that. The other thing about this skull you'll notice is the enormous size of its brain. For the size of a bird, this is much, much bigger than the brain of a chicken or or, or something like that. So, very specialized, speed-eating, seed-eating birds. One of the things they can do, not only can they crush seeds to get the nutrients out of them, when we do research on them, for example, if we put satellite collars on them to follow where they fly in the jungle, they are really good at snipping them off if they, if they don't feel like carrying them. So, 
Those big beaks are powerful weapons. As I've just said, I, we believe that parrots are the smartest of the birds. They're as smart as primates. They're really, you could argue, they're the primates of the bird world. Really, really smart, really intelligent. They can invent and make tools, and I'll give you an example of that later on. They can communicate very well. They can talk to their friends over long distances. They can recognize their friends. That large, loud squawking that you heard a few minutes ago was one of our parrots communicating with the other members of the flock. And it has to be loud because when you live in the jungle, the sound has to go for a long, long distance. Some species, not all, adopt, adapt very readily to new environments. You'll see some of the birds we, we're going to show you today, in fact, are South American birds that have adapted to living all across North America. Some parrots live in the big cities. There are big populations of parrots in big cities like Los Angeles and Miami. Unfortunately, there's other parrots that are not quite so adaptable and as a result are severely threatened. And as I mentioned a moment ago, these parrots live for a very long time. So how smart are they? Well, you all know about talking parrots, right? They excel at copying noises, they excel at copying human speech, and some of them can, in effect, conduct a conversation. That they can talk to people, they can imitate accents, and sometimes, of course, this can be very, very amusing and, and makes them, in some senses, excellent companions, excellent pets. Um, they can count. We'll talk about this in a minute. Parrots have the ability to count numbers. And this, again, is a, is a very useful skill when you're sort of looking the size of your flock or trying to find out where to, where to go in the jungle. Uh, they can, of course, identify colors, and they can put names to colors, as you'd expect when they live in a colorful environment. Uh, they use tools, and we'll, we'll come back in a minute. They can actually use inanimate objects to help them achieve their goals, which is what, what we consider to, tool formation. And not only can they recognize their friends and neighbors, among other birds, but they can identify individual humans. Again, that squawking you heard earlier on was the parrot was talking to a human friend who they identify as a member of their flock. So there are all these remarkable qualities. And of course, this is important. If you live in a specific environment, if you live in the rainforest, if you live in the desert, you need to know a lot about your environment. They, they need to be able to find their way around. Uh, we've done research using satellite collars to put on large parts, to put on the macaws, and then follow their movement across the Amazon rainforest. This is not something you can do on the ground, but satellites can follow where those birds go. And what we find is they can travel hundreds of miles in any direction. Often they travel for miles just to find a specific tree with fruit on it. And they know what time of the year to go and exactly where to go to find that tree. Other times, we can see that they actually navigate across the forest, essentially searching for new feeding trees. So they know where they are, they know when to go, that probably they learn, in many cases, from their parents just where, uh, where to go in the forest in order to find those resources. So they have really great navigation skills. Parrots, of course, uh, are not the only bird that has great navigation skills. Think of all those birds that are migrating from South America into North America this spring. They also know exactly where they're going and can find the way back to the environment that they like or the home, that the place they call home in the summer. One of the reasons for being able to do this, of course, simply is looking for food. Um, life's hard if you don't know where the food is. So especially if you're a specialized seed eater, like parrots are, you've got to know 
where the fruiting trees are, what time of the year the seeds come, and when you can therefore go over and start harvesting them. And of course, once, once the birds find the fruiting tree, they can literally destroy it. They can tear it apart as they, they search, as they seek to exploit those nutrients in, in the seed. Uh, of course, it's also a useful thing if you can avoid predators, if you, you don't want to be eaten by hawks or things like that. So you want to be able to find your way around and, and know where not to go, know what parts of the world are dangerous. And then the other thing is, of course, you've got to find a mate. You've got to find a friend. And if you live in, in the rainforest and you're flying around, you, know, you need to know where other parrots hang out. You need to, uh, to, to have some sense of where to go at a specific time of the year to find, to find friends and mates. And parrots have that ability in, in spades. Um, let me talk for a minute about tool making. Tool making is the, the use of inanimate objects to, to achieve a, a goal. And uh, there are many good examples among the birds where they can make tools. But parrots excel in this. Let me tell you a story about a parrot that was trying to get some seed that had fallen underneath a piece of furniture. So what did the parrot do? He sort of examined the situation. He found a stick, but the stick was too big. The stick was too thick. So what did the parrot do? It actually chewed on the stick to make it thinner so that eventually it would fit under the furniture and he could pull out the seed that he otherwise couldn't get. So these birds can really think about what's happening and plan, plan, plan ahead. Uh, the other thing that happened in that example was that the friends of this tool-making parrot, the parrot that thinned the stick down, all caught on to what he was doing and they copied that so they can watch other birds see what works for them and copy them just and essentially learn readily. Uh, the other thing that uh, they can do is uh, recently it's been shown that bird, birds of course like calcium. They need, need calcium. Remember, you find get calcium in milk, you need it for strong bones and teeth and in the case of birds, you need it to make eggs. And in the case of parrots, it was noticed that these birds could actually take limestone, which is a source of calcium, grind it up with their beaks to make a powder, and then sprinkle that powder on their food. So in essence, they could um, add condiments, as it were, like salt and pepper, to their food in order to make it more healthful for them and, uh, and provide them with, with essential uh, nutrients. We talked about, we all know that parrots can talk. That's well recognized. Um, and I say it's one of the things that makes them incredibly attractive pets. That some, some birds can have a vocabulary of well over a hundred words and can put them together in what appear to be coherent sentences. Uh, but birds also talk to each other. One of the things that's been found out about parrots is that, of course, in, in many places they fly around in flocks. And each flock has its own dialect. They talk in a particular manner. And you can differentiate between flocks by the way they talk. So that's one thing. The birds can listen, the parrots can listen, and know where their friends are, and uh, make sure they always belong to the same family group. But it's interesting. Scientists have taken baby parrots and moved them into a new flock. And they can learn the dialect. They can learn the accent of the new flock of birds. And as a result, um, the birds can adopt, essentially learn a foreign language. And just as in humans, young birds do it much better than older birds. When they're young and their brains are still developing, they can learn all sorts of interesting things as their brain, brain develops. In fact, one of the things that's interesting about birds in general is that their brains develop in large part after they're hatched. You know, we humans, we mammals, most of, most of our brain development occurs before we're born. But in the case of birds, much of the development occurs afterwards, for example, in response to, 
bird song in response to signals from their parents, that their brain can develop in a very specific and unique way. So bird brains are very much adapted to learning language. As I pointed out, this enormous uh, beak that parrots have, this beak that's so characteristic of parrots, is very much designed to crunch tough seeds. Tough seeds contain lots of nutrients, and that big beak can really cut into and destroy those seeds and make the nutrients in them available to parrots. Um, this has some consequences thinking of having a, a pet parrot because they can be very destructive in captivity. With big, strong beaks like that, they can destroy furniture very readily. And as I point out, they can remove leg bands, they can remove collars. And not only that, but with that beak, they use it. Well, one of the things they use it for is climbing around. It's, it's like an additional hand. They can, they can pull themselves around trees by the use of the beak. But it's been shown that parrots can actually open complex locks. They can slide bars. They can lift things. They can go through a series of steps. Because they're so smart and because they have that useful beak, they can open locks that are incredibly clever. One of the problems we find here is keeping birds in cages is that they're very smart in opening the lock and finding their way out. A lot of scientists have done research, long research, on the brains, the intelligence of parrots. And uh, the, the classical bird that's been done, you might have heard of Alex, the African gray parrot, which uh, was studied for many years at Harvard University. And uh, this bird uh, showed that, first of all, it could, uh, it knew its numbers up to eight. So it, not only that, but it could do simple arithmetic. It could actually add up to three numbers, three small numbers. It could put them together in a very effective manner. Um, it also, curious enough, could understand the concept of none, the concept of zero. Now, we don't have actually understand how its brain worked, how it did that. But this parrot clearly could recognize that, in essence, there was a something that we call zero, which is an interesting concept when you think about it. Think about what the zero is, what, what, what nothing is. And as I say, this, this part could, could open complex uh, uh, blocks. As I say, I pointed out before, the parrots, some parts are just incredibly adaptable. They can adapt to new environments. We're going to show you in a few minutes some monk parakeets, which um, are uh, intro an introduced species into this country. They actually originate in, in South America, but they've become established in cities all across this country. Um, as I point out to you, there's huge flocks of introduced parrots that fly around our big cities like Miami and Los Angeles, where the climate is just right. Um, unfortunately, some parrots, some very specialized parrots, aren't doing too well in the wild because they're too adaptive. And of course, there are threats to them, the usual threats. The pet trade is a threat. People taking baby parrots from the wild, that's a no-no, right? Because that, of course, is a way to destroy wild parrot populations. And then the other issue is, of course, environmental destruction. If people cut down the forest, if people destroy the rainforest, well, then parrots are going to have nowhere to live. So parrots. Some of them are incredibly adaptable. Some of them are not doing so well. Some of them are, are highly, highly endangered. We're going to give you a little demonstration here uh, about training parrots. Ms. Woodman is going to demonstrate how she trains some African gray, uh, some monk parakeets. Uh, and let me, let me comment uh, about monk parakeets and, and how we have them here uh, for research. These are South American birds. They actually come from Argentina. And they were introduced into this country as pets. And some of them escaped. And when they escaped, they found they really liked this country. The climate was good, nice people would feed them. 
And so as a result, there are large flocks of monk parakeets in many of the big cities around this country. Big flocks in Houston, big flocks in Austin, in Chicago, in New York, all thriving. So this is a very, very adaptable species. Now, the problem with monk parakeets is that they build enormous nests. They're, they're, they're what are called communal nesters. They all, they all nest together in, in one big nest. And what they really, really like to build their nests on are in electricity substations, on electricity power lines. And of course, if those big nests disrupt the electricity supply or cause short circuiting, then the net result is that uh, the power company gets upset, people get upset because their electricity is cut off. And as a result, power companies are obliged to remove those monk parakeet nests when they find them. But that leaves a lot of orphan birds. And we have accepted these orphan birds for our studies in bird behavior and parrot, and parrot health. So now what we're going to do now is show you, give you a little demonstration on how to train a parrot. So first I'll show you a behavior with this male monk parakeet. Uh, we're going to have him go towards what's known as a target stick. Good. So I held up the target stick, and when he came over, I used what's known as a bridge to let him know he'd done the exact right behavior, and then I offered him his reward. Okay, great. So I'll show you some of the tools involved in training and talk about why we use training on the animals. So <clears throat> here's a food pouch. We can put the rewards, the food items that the animals are working for, into the pouch so they only see the rewards once they've done the right behavior. That way, sometimes the greedier birds will get confused if you hold out food and you ask them to do something at the same time. The rewards we give the birds here at the Shibot Center are things like these nutri berries, which is a commercial carrot food, very healthy for them. It is very healthy for them. And millet, a small seed. And because these seeds are very small, even though they're higher fat than the more healthy food, the birds can eat a whole lot of them without throwing their diet out of whack because we're very careful about their health and diet here. So when I demonstrated, I held up the target stick. He came to the target stick, and then I gave him a bridge. The bridge means you did the right thing. And what we do when we start training is we use the bridge, in this case the verbal bridge good, and we pair it with the reward. And so I say, good, and I give him a reward. I say, good, and I give him a reward. Good, 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 over and over again, until he knows when he hears the word good, he's going to get a reward. Then he'll start trying to get me to say good. Maybe when I walk by the cage, he'll start bobbing and whistling and moving his wings. And I can use those behaviors. So if he comes over to me um, in order to get that good, to get his reward, I can start holding up like this little flashlight, our target stick, and he can go over the target. And once they get very good at going to the target, um, <clears throat> in order to get that good to get the reward, well, we can do wonderful things. For example, if he were to open the locks on his cage door, which does not happen that often at the shoebox center, we do have good equipment for that, Dr. Um, we have had a couple times, though, when they slip past folks during uh, toy hanging, well, we can take the light, hey, hello, yeah, we can take the light, Leave the light or the laser pointer, and it's his job to go to that, to get the good, to get the reward. And so he'll come right down from the second story of the aviary building over to the light, and they can get back in their cage using that training. <clears throat> this kind of target training is also very valuable because it allows us to check the health of the animals. So as you can see, he came over and he's hanging out at the last place he got his food reward. And that gives me a chance to examine his feet, look at his beak, his face. And so when he needs a medical exam or a quick check over, I can call him over with a target stick, review his health, listen to his breathing, anything quick, without ever having to grab him up or stress him. And the best way to work with animals is to be gentle and kind and have them participate. Exactly. Have them participate instead of have them be coerced. So when we got him over here, we used this carrier. And so what I did is I put this carrier up to his big cage, which we'll show you in a minute in the main aviary, put the target stick in, he ran into the target stick, I closed the cage door, 
And then here, I placed it in front of his little cage, and then I tried to let him in. <coughs> he actually really wanted to go to the TV camera, so I had to have him step up with my hand and put him in the cage. Well, you were being obnoxious. Uh, he really, really likes TV cameras. Uh, but what's neat about that is the animals are voluntarily going into their carriers. They're voluntarily participating in the work they do here. And the more you have an animal participate in its own care, the more humane it is. And it's very important to be humane and kind and work with animals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about his mini cage here. This isn't his main house. This is just a display cage. You'll see the main cage in a little bit. <coughs> so what we've got here is a mini example of what you want in a good parrot cage. This is a natural wood perch. The natural wood perch has all sorts of knobs and texture to it. Because if a bird sits on a flat perch all the time, it can develop sores on its feet. And those sores can be very, very bad in a condition called bumblefoot. But by having a natural perch with lots of different textures, every time he sits on the perch, he sits a little bit different, and he doesn't have too much pressure on his feet. And here we have some toys that we made here at the Shoebot Center. This is full of little plastic bits and all sorts of colors. And the natural things parrots do in the wild, going long distances and examining lots of different objects to try to find food or exist sites, well, they have those same drives if they're in a cage. So we give them lots of interesting objects to explore and work with with their beaks and play with. For example, these drinking straws are great because they can peel off the paper layer, play with the paper, play tug of war, dip the paper in the water, watch it swell up. Then they can play with the straws inside, and there's lots of opportunities for exploring a new object. So we make a lot of toys here at the Shoebot Center. For example, we have these ones up for display, but he's already pulled them down. Um, just a piece of folded paper into a fan, a very fun to chew on, very interesting to play with. You can see right now, he's immediately interested in it. <coughs> so when we do the training, we keep very careful records. We actually have a phone app that our students go to a website for, and they record all of the training and interaction with the birds, so we keep good records. The kind of training we're engaging in using the cue, that verbal bridge, that good, and then the reward, is called operant conditioning. And operant conditioning is one of the best ways to modify animal behavior. For my research, I work with these animals' behavior and intelligence. So I'm interested in how to return rare birds to the wild. And my interest is to teach them new behaviors that they could use to go from being in a place with humans to a natural location like a forest. We're testing, one of the ways we're testing to do this is automated through something kind of like video games. And so this little guy has actually used a computer in the past to play different kinds of games so we can see how automated training and learning can work with birds. This is important because in the United States, we have rare parrots such as the Puerto Rican parrot which is an Amazon parrot, and that parrot has been rescued from the Jealous all? Um, <coughs> the Puerto Rican parrot has been rescued from the brink of extinction through breeding and release programs. However, other parrots native to the United States, such as the thick-billed parrot, um, we haven't had success with breeding release yet. And the other kind of parrot native to the United States the Carolina parakeet was extinct before anybody was able to do any conservation action. What I'd like to do is take a look at the, is Tori here? To run the camera? Great. Tori, can you take a look at the big cage where he would normally live in the aviary? Okay, great. So Tori's going to switch the camera feed to our aviary where the Quaker parakeets live. This is one of several different spaces within the Shoebot Center where these animals live when we're studying them to learn more about parrots. In the cage, you can see, hopefully, I'm going to go over and take a look at Tori's screen, you can hopefully see that there are a number of <coughs> birds. Yeah, we've got a number of young juvenile birds who are interacting in a large flight cage. This cage is very big. It allows them to fly and play and interact. You can see there are toys, different kinds of perches. I think in the shot, you can see that we've got natural light from the window so the animals get to look outside. And the way we've kept them is pretty good. So don't think of birds in captivity as living in tiny cages. Think that they should have nice big flight cages, lots of toys and friends. Because that's how we keep them here at the Shoebot Center and we try to maintain best practices. Thanks, Rory. <coughs> Let's 
So you can, you can see from Connie's comments that if we're going to keep these remarkably intelligent, clever, and beautiful birds in captivity, we need to think very carefully about using them as pets. Generally, they should be left in the wild. But obviously, people do breed these birds as pets, and many people love them as companions. They are, as we've just said, very, very smart. They can learn tricks. They can be amusing companions. They can talk. And especially for older people who are perhaps uh, alone, they, as I say, they can, they can be absolutely wonderful pets. But there's several things you have to remember about pirates as pets. First of all, different species, different birds have different personalities. Not, you can't really generalize and say all size fits all. That, uh, that one has to be very careful in selecting any parrot that you think might be, uh, you might want as a pet to make sure that, that, you're, uh, uh, that they're companionable. And also, you have to make sure that they're well trained. One of the problems that we see with uh, parrots as, uh, as pets is that unless the birds are hand trained and used to working with, uh, with humans from the earliest age, then they, they tend to be fairly unfriendly, that they, they think of themselves as parrots and, and while certainly with excellent training um, they can make good pets, it's sometimes very difficult for, for people to, uh, to, to do that. So you have to make sure that these birds are used to humans and see humans as their friends and companions from the earliest age. One thing that Connie pointed out is that because they're very smart, they need constant stimulation. They get bored easily. And that means, just like you kids, they need lots of toys. They, they need to be amused. Because if they're bored, then they start making a mess. Then they use that big beak to, to, to destroy the curtains. That's right. So they, they're, and, then, and because they're so intelligent, they're also a much greater responsibility than a conventional pet like a dog or a cat. You can't leave a parrot alone for the weekend with a bowl of food. They will get upset, they will get bored, they will get destructive, they will get mad at you, and simply that is inappropriate behavior. Parrots are an enormous responsibility if you're going to keep them as, as pets. And not only that, you've got to play with them. You've got to play with them every day. The way, the way Constance plays with her birds. You've got to interact with them on a daily basis. And obviously, if you're going to consider that, consider do you have time in your daily schedule, right? Not only do you have to keep them clean, not only do you have to clean out the cages, but you've got to play with them on a daily basis. Because as I say, they do get bored, they do get upset, and then they can be destructive. You've got to give them, as, as constant point out, good food, uh, we use Zucreen, um, and very good cage hygiene. Birds in the wild can fly around. They can fly away from their poop, they can spread across the rainforest, and they can do all sorts of interesting things and get away from the dirt. But of course, birds in a cage, birds housed indoors, sometimes can. So hygiene, clean water, clean cages are absolutely critical. So, they they need companionship, they need uh, conversation, they need playtime. And then the other thing to remember that is, is increasingly an issue is that they live for a very, very long time. As I indicated to you previously, we know that some of the big parrots can live for over 100 years. So if you're an older individual, one of the things you have to worry about is that you're parrot may well outlive you. So uh, this is an issue when it comes to having uh, parrots as pets. It's an enormous commitment, very different from having a dog or cat. 
The other thing that we pointed out, and Constance pointed out, is that parrots do need toys. That in order to make life interesting in a cage, uh, they need some sort of amusement. We try various things to, to uh, uh, amuse them. Um, we've already discussed that a moment ago. One of the things we do is we actually hide their food. Um, because in the wild, birds have to go hunting for their food, um, it's really not natural for them to have a bowl of food placed in front of them. So one of the ways we enrich, enrich their lives is to hide their food so that they can go foraging. You can hide the food inside a hollow piece of wood or, or in a paper bag or something like that that gives them the challenge of searching for their food. Do you, do you have some demonstrations, Connie, of uh, some toys that we perhaps can, can show uh, everybody how they might make? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Come on, Go over here. Go talk. So here's a variety of foraging toys, some of which you can buy uh, manufactured, some of which can be made at home at low cost. One of the fun things about making toys at home with the parrot is the parrot gets to help you make the toys, which means scatter all the parts of the toys where you can make the toys, but they like that. So here's a very simple foraging toy. This is a cereal box that's got a couple pieces of masking tape holding it shut, and inside the cereal box are a variety of interesting objects for the bird to explore, the top of the water bottle, a child's plastic toy, popsicle sticks, lots of different goodies, some of which are edible. I think there's popcorn. And so the bird uses its natural behavior, like it would chewing through the wall of a plant to get to something delicious, to chew through the box and find the food inside. Here we have a different kind of foraging toy. This is a dishwashed old medicine bottle that the cap has been masking taped on. And so the bird, in order to get to the goodies, has to peel off or chew off the masking tape, figure out how to get the top off the bottle, and then they get access to the fun toys and edible food inside the foraging toy. And by the way, foraging is the word for how an animal finds food in the wild when they go from place to place in search of food. This is a commercial foraging puzzle. So this is a maze. And in this case, the food is rotated through the maze by the bird who grabs the hole and uses the puzzle. And this kind of toy is really fun because they have to use their minds to figure out how to get the food to the end of the toy. And they have to do it without hands. So some of the stuff that would be pretty easy for us is a little more tricky for them. Other things you can do for foraging include putting little bits of food inside something like a wiffle ball. So the animal has to rotate it, get just to the right angle, have the food fall to the hole, then pull the food out of the hole. Or you could do something like this paper toy and sneak food into many different folds of paper. So the animal goes through as though gathering seeds from a plant, or fruits from a plant, and pulls all the food out. When making toys for birds, it doesn't always have to be foraging toys. They do like exploring new objects. So in this case, we have a little um, practice golf ball with small strings with beads and wooden squares and buttons and pieces of straw attached. For a small bird like the Quaker parakeet, he might spend a couple days working through this. Though for a big bird like a macaw, this would be gone very quickly. So we have to make toys differently depending on which birds we're making for the year. To make toys safe, though, is very important. The kinds of strings we use on the toys are things like leather cords or this heavy pawing rope. These kinds of strings don't tangle easily, and that's important because if the bird is left alone to play with its toys and were to get tangled, well, they're not going to be able to easily chew through a rope and untangle themselves. So here at the Shoebot Center, we don't use thin cotton thread, we don't use string, we don't use anything that the birds can tangle in. We can also use things like the zip tie to attach toys. So if we want to attach this wiffle ball safely to the side of the cage, we can just zip it on. And then when we're done with it, we can clip it off with a pair of scissors. 
and this is a great way to attach toys safely, as are some of our other tools, such as these C-clips with locking rings. Because the same way that Dr. Desard identified that the birds can get out of their cages, they can also unhook their toys. In fact, some uh, birds, such as cockatoos and kias, which is a kind of bird from New Zealand, are amazingly good at undoing hardware. If you put them in the wrong kind of cage, you come in the next day and they've undone all the nuts and bolts, and they're sitting there on a perch, on a base, with a cage completely disassembled around them. Um, so we have to think very carefully about the safety for the animals. <coughs> Here, uh, with this temporary display cage we've got, we've used zip ties to close all the doors. The main door here, you can see we've got double metal latches, and that way we can keep him safe. He can go out and fly, he actually does flying exercises um, as a demonstration, but we don't want to let him out unaccompanied because things like ceiling lights, sinks, windows, uh, the bright projection screen, he could fly into or interact with in a negative way or find an electrical cord. And so when you choose to take responsibility to repair it, whether it's as a pet or in this case as an animal to help us understand health and behavior better, you take a big responsibility because this is not the environment that he's evolved to live in. So we have to do a lot of work to make his life in this environment very comfortable. So I think uh, maybe if there's any questions, uh, we would be happy to uh, enter. Any questions? I have one right quick. Uh, yes, sir. You're talking about eggs and, and, and baby chicks. Are, are the parents good parents? Um, it depends. Yes, obviously they, um, they are good parents, generally to the first chick, but it, it differs between species. In the big macaws that we look at, the scarlet macaws, they generally lay two eggs, but they tend to ignore the second chick. So it depends from the point of view of the first chick. Yeah, they're great parents. From the point of view of the second chick, no, they're miserable parents. You mentioned they had a nice big beak for open, opening seeds, uh, but don't they have to manipulate them a certain way to be able to open that seed? Yes, they also have a, a very flexible tongue, a leathery tongue inside their beak that they can use to, to, to move uh, the uh, seed around to get it aligned in exactly the right way so they, they, they can crunch it, yes. The very, 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 very flexible and, and, and very skillful in moving and manipulating material in their mouth. As Tony has pointed out, it's basically their beak that they use to, uh, to unlock locks and, and do all these other clever things. You want to add anything? Well, and we're about to wait for questions to come in. I actually brought a stuffed bird if you want to do a demo of how we do a medical exam. You going to do that? Unless you want to help. <laughs> okay, why don't we do it on this side of the bird? That's a good idea. So I talked about how you can have a bird voluntarily participate in its own care. Sometimes, though, you do have to restrain an animal for, say, a medical emergency. For example, <clears throat> in an older bird, uh, maybe he might get a crack in his beak, and we'd have to treat that. What does that look like? Well, this is our standing parrot. To restrain a bird, what we want to do is we want to hold him quickly and get him calm to do any sort of medical work. And so what we do is we use a towel or a cloth, and we quickly toss it over the animal. And this doesn't have to be scary. In fact, you can practice with a cloth like this for fun, and the animal can think of it as a game. Because remember, many medical uh, treatments don't hurt. For example, listening to the heart doesn't hurt. It can be fun. It can be a game. So you can play peekaboo with your bird until he's comfy. And once he's cozy with that, you can toss the towel over, and then you can get him in a restrained hold so you can examine his body. And what you do is you grab at the base of the skull. These birds have a very unique jaw. They can move both the upper and lower beak. So where we only move our bottom jaw, they can move the top part too. And they can fish. Yeah. You want to see? 
He's really curious, isn't he? Um, so when we grip them, we can't grip the mechanisms that open the top and bottom of the jaw because we might hurt the animal. We might break its tiny, fine bones that control that mechanism. So we grip low at the base of the head, around the neck, and then we may hold the wings and around the feet like this. And again, this can be fun for the bird. If you play it as a wrestling game with a towel, the bird's like, oh, you picked me up, tummy raspberry time. And that allows us access to listen to the heart, to the lungs, to check the quality of the beak or the mouth, examine the bottom of the feet, and the vent, which is where they poop from. And that's really important, too, because you can learn a lot about their health from their vent. And so once you have the bird like this, you can also pull out a wing, and usually one person will hold the head, and another person might help pull out the wing, and you can examine the wing feathers and the anatomy of the animal. And once you're done, you set the bird back down, you uncover him, and you give him a chance to catch his breath if you've done anything that made him uncomfortable. But as you can see, the tools for doing this kind of exam, like this cloth, don't have to be scary. They can be really fun. And you can see that he's starting to get used to all of the tools that we use for medical exams, so that going to the doctor isn't scary for these animals. Some of the common medical <laughs> he really likes that. Like, so as you can see, this is not a bird who's scared by being wrapped up in a towel. Um, <clears throat> Some of the common medical things we do with these guys is we may need to take their blood to make sure their blood levels are good. And when we do that, we hold them, again, with a towel uh, to, hold, to keep their eyes covered, keep them calm, grab the base of the neck, and there's a big vein right here, and we can do a base function, draw a little bit of blood. And it doesn't hurt them very much at all, it's just a little prick. And sometimes they can even get very used to it. The other sorts of medical procedures you have to do on a bird might be treating them for things like egg binding. Sometimes a female bird might get the eggs stuck in her. And so in that case, you would towel her and you would gently massage the egg out. And so there's a lot of different ways that we treat the animals and we work with them in medicine. Our veterinarians here at the Shubat Center work with veterinary students to teach them about birds. Because we're the only veterinary school in Texas and the Shubat Center is very unique, the veterinary students who get to work with these birds to learn how to handle birds and do medicine with birds have an excellent experience that's unmatched, I think, anywhere else in the nation, which is pretty cool. I hear you guys talking. Another two minutes? Okay. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes. Sounds good. Uh, do, I have a question. Sure, Doctor. Uh, do, you, do you accept uh, toys from, from outside, like uh, could a group of students make some toys that you could use uh, with the animals. Absolutely. Donations are great because as you've seen, we use a lot of recycled <coughs> materials for our toys. If anybody wants to donate to the Shubat Center, um, plastic children's toys, paper bags, trays, cardboard pieces, um, cardboard tubes. We avoid some of the paper towel tubes though because there's some glues that our veterinarians are concerned about so we don't use those. <coughs> Natural branches, we've actually had folks who have cut down um, trees, donate branches for our cages. <coughs> um, tag board sheets, cardboard sheets, uh, even things like if you want to make a pile of those paper fortune tellers, the birds love to play with those. And so if you can donate any materials that we can use for the toys, we have almost 300 parrots here. And every single one of those birds gets toys and entertainment to keep them busy in their cages since, okay, again, it isn't quite as complex as the forest, we need to enrich their lives by providing all of those toys and other things. What if the students wanted to make some toys and then maybe uh, determine which one would last longer? That kind of experiment is actually very important. Uh, <clears throat> there are laws for the care of animals in laboratories and for pets at home. And we do research on enrichment, looking at what's the best way to keep the animals entertained. If students would like to donate as a classroom project, we actually have a book of toy designs, and we'd be happy to share those with a teacher if you'd like to do a classroom day, because we, we really do need lots of toys for these birds. We actually have hired staff, and their whole job is to sit down and make hundreds and hundreds of toys. <clears throat> Okay, well, I think, I think we've run out of time now, uh, but thank you, uh, thank you for watching us. Uh, you can contact us if you want to find us on the web. 
if you look up Texas A&M University and look up the name of our center, it's called Shubot, S-C-H-U-B-O-T. If you Google that, you can find our website and learn a lot more about our program. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Very good. Let me ask you a question. Over here. Yes, sir. Uh, out of the light. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, one of the practices in China is that people have birds in their houses, and they bring them out to uh, to let uh, them see other birds. Yeah. Is is that I, good or what I is that? I've seen competitions. No, generally not, because these birds, uh, the ones I've seen in China, are generally in very small cages. Um, individual birds, and of course they're captured from the wild, which is very much an inappropriate thing. Uh, many bird species in China are threatened because of this, uh, th this bird trade. Um, birds like Quaker parakeets that we've talked about today, as I say, they're an introduced species in this country. Uh, they're not endangered, they're actually thriving. Um, so one has to be very careful about the species you get, and then also as We've tried to emphasize here the way you house them, the way you entertain them, the way you manage them. They're not just dogs and cats, they're much more than that. <laughs>